Um, all right. Uh, thanks, everybody, uh, for joining us for our last session. Uh, really excited to hear from Anastasia. We had Anastasia speak uh, last year at a conference, and uh, a lot of things have changed. And it's certainly one of the great, brilliant minds in precision agriculture. Really, uh, being uh, enjoyed watching the the development that she's been involved in. A little bit of background of Anastasia. Anastasia will. Kova is a PhD and is the CEO and co-founder of Regrow Ag. She has her PhD in visual drone navigation with the Australian Defense Science and Technology Organization. She has 10 years of experience in academia, business, and software development. Anastasia is the 2020 MIT 35 under 35 innovator and one of the BBC's 2020 100 Women. Pretty impressive. So please take it away, Anastasia. Thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for joining. I know I've been through quite a number of sessions, so I'm glad that you joined me and hopefully I'll tell you something that'll be interesting and, and new for you today. Um, Andrew, can you give me a confirmation? You all can see my screen, just double checking. We are good to go, yeah. Perfect, perfect, excellent. Well, um, you might have uh, remembered uh, the session from last year, as Andrew mentioned, um, uh, I am the CEO and co-founder of the same company. <laughs> it rebranded from Florisat to Regrow as we have broadened our impact on the industry and have really wanted to, uh, wanted to embrace uh, that identity. Today, I wanna be speaking to you about the evolution of our space, uh, of precision agriculture, and um, how we should look at it uh, from the perspective of not just tools to make um, the decisions on the farm more cost effective, but also the opportunities that uh, these technologies offer um, when we're looking at additional incomes from um, environmentally driven incentives um, that can either sit within precision conservation or sustainable agronomy. And there's a, it's not a very big separation there, but it still does a very distinct and different things. And hopefully we'll speak about them today. So starting from where we were, I should say that everyone thinks of uh, the growing season as the season where um, things go in cycles and every year they, they go through the same um, state, set of stages. Um, in some countries, like those in the southern hemisphere, they can even go twice uh, in the year because you can get uh, double cropping and triple cropping even happening. Um, so let's go through each of the stages and um, a review what tools have been um, available uh, for the decision uh, support in these at these times of the year. So first, when you're planting and looking at how the crops are emerging, you of course uh, are interested in, in crop performance. Um, these are some of the applications that are driven by satellite imagery, by crop uh, growth models. They can be also weather driven, those models. Um, in essence, you are looking to optimize the time that goes into figuring out where a crop is at and uh, where you should pay most attention, how you should time your operations. And then when you're a little bit deeper into the growing stage, um, many uh, professionals in precision agriculture have of course looked at variable rate application um, of, of nutrients uh, in season, uh, specifically this is the one I'm talking about in season, of course you can do so pre-season as well. Um, and this is about optimizing the return. So some of the um, hectares can definitely do more. Some of them are tapped out and you want to be distributing the resources where they're most useful. The first pass we'll do by talking about these tools more classically, and then we will tie them to some of the benefits of environmental programs and sustainable agronomy that um, you might not have quite seen they've been tied to uh, in the past like this. Um, when the crop is a bit more progressed, of course, pest and disease scouting starts. Um, and here's where also precision agriculture tools can help um, by monitoring the fields um, all the time, picking up all the satellite imagery, picking up all the information from agronomists, scouting in the fields, relating those two together, highlighting the areas where the crops are looking like they're going to be stressed. This might not be visible with the naked eye. 
I think all of the precision ag professionals kind of know how these tools can be used. Um, and the essence here, of course, the primary value proposition has been to protect the crop, to find issues faster, to mitigate them faster, again, to reduce, to reduce the costs. Um, finally, as far as the season is concerned, we look at harvest, and here um, we, of course, are looking at the harvest readiness of the fields. Um, so if you're looking to harvest the farm in a particular direction, if you're at a cooperative and you're looking to support your farmers with harvest, uh, you would benefit greatly from knowing the uh, senescent stages of the fields um, and know how ready they are uh, for um, harvest. Often this is also indicative of quality. Um, here, it's interesting to think that not only you can save on fuel uh, of running machinery uh, to, um, um, to perform harvest operations um, by looking at the map of knowing where all the crops are, are at and which are most ready for harvest, but you can also optimize your, your impact, um, the compaction, uh, the quality of the grain you pick up, all of those, um, all of those good, good things. Um, now that we talked about the season, this is where classical precision agriculture kind of stops. And this is interesting because this is where the conservation decisions begin. After harvest and about at harvest, really you make decisions about how you harvest and how do you manage the residue? How do you manage the soil? This is where we see the emergence of, of, of new tools that for example, uh, in the version that Regrow is building as, as all of these tools are, are our tools and I'm just using them as an example of what's available to you and how you can think about it. Um, personalization of conservation practices. So if you're looking at how you are going to manage these fields, crop rotations, is this an appropriate uh, which fields are appropriate for cover cropping, if, if any, if at all, uh, which fields are appropriate for uh, changes in tillage. Uh, for some regions, this is still um, very much a pricing point. For some regions, this is a given. Um, of which fields are um, most suitable for uh, variable nutrient management or um, adoption of, of biological products to uh, avoid some of the uh, synthetic use and, and the emissions and pollution that comes with that. These are some of the decisions you can make at this stage. You're um, deciding how to how to harvest, how to manage the residue, what happens over winter, um, if you're in a region where you can uh, afford to make those decisions, or you can plan the next year with the nutrition program. Um, finally, uh, when you're making those decisions, what you're contributing to is a larger shift in the region um, as to how the sustainability practices are being adopted. Um, and it's important for um, the players that are not con con connected to the farm directly, such as agronomists or input providers or advisors, uh, to be aware of this information. So we work a lot with non-for-profit and government organizations as well, where we use um, imagery and de-identified information. We do not take um, any of the farmer information that we surface within decision support tools. We take public data sets that we translate and we see, well, we don't work with any farmers in this area, but we have the knowledge uh, with the known accuracy of how the adoption of conservation tillage cover cropping um, is going in a particular area. And this is again, something that incentivizes the players downstream to invest again into upstream. This is where we can start revisiting what the precision agriculture tools were really about and what opportunities they, they hide right now, um, such as um, maybe when you're looking at the crop performance, you're really inferring what cultivation changes or what crop rotation changes can you make. You can make a, a decision about diversifying your crop rotation if you're looking that some soil um, is more suitable for it. Um, you can also make, of course, decision on based on the soil type and performance and emergence of the crops to change um, any cultivation decisions. When you're looking at nutrient management, this is pretty much a direct opportunity to affect emission profile of the farm, um, including the fact that we talked about the emission profiles in, in the harvesting um, uh, part of the season based on the equipment specifically. Here, we talk about the embedded emissions that specifically growers in Canada are very aware of um, because they're paying taxes on synthetic fertilizers. 
um, but more growers uh, becoming aware of it. Um, the opportunity here is that if you reduce the nitrogen waste, um, the not just the emissions that happen when the, the when the fertilizer is manufactured, but the losses that happen when it's actually being distributed um, on the field, it can depend on the mode of application, it can depend on the amount, on the timing, on, on many things. And if you can cut the losses, um, you certainly can earn some effectively environmental or ecosystem service credits for it. Um, lastly, when you think about the areas um, of the fields or the areas on the farm, some of the fields altogether maybe, where they're just not performing as well. And traditionally there hasn't been an opportunity to do anything with them that would um, quantify, qualify as a productive use of the land. Um, potentially in some regions now you have conservation opportunities where the organizations that look to improve the conservation of the farmland to improve the water quality through planting buffers or, for example, improving biodiversity through planting pollinator habitats. There's plenty of support um, for those types of initiatives that the farmers want to implement and that the companies want to, to uh, help them um, make, make happen. Of course, um, you can see here how we looked at the traditional tools that are pretty much about how do you manage things better? And before it was very much a cost saving equation. Whilst now many of these things not only can yield a longer term um, resilience of the farm of which we'll speak in a second, but also it can create new revenue opportunities. Um, this is one of the most exciting messages I probably can leave in my entire keynote presentations and that sustainability uh, and sustainable agronomy is really a path to um, more longer term resilience and, and more, more revenue on the farm. So now when we have taken this micro view, um, I want to step back a little bit and say, why do we think this works? Why are we seeing that this works? What is it that is driving the system to change? And I want to make emphasis on important factors that are sometimes overlooked. Starting with the obvious is the net zero goals and the UN sustainable development goals. Many companies are adopting them. And this is not just because of the pure goodness of the heart, but this is because it is imperative that the climate related risks that are um, very much affecting food and agriculture companies and anyone who's dependent on um, the supply of agricultural commodities um, needs to manage that risk. And that becomes a, quite a substantial risk financially. Um, whilst this is happening upstream, of course, this is the case also on the farm. For the farmer, um, adopting good, good practices um, and demonstrating that they have adopted good practices um, does mean that they should be able to qualify for even lower um, credit um, on, on their uh, lower interest on their credit. Um, so loaning money uh, cheaply um, and, of course, demonstrating uh, to um, those that fund them, insurance companies, finance companies, that the farm resilience uh, through improved soil health is being built up, meaning that really you're building the yield resilience, which means that you will have more stable yields regardless of the fluctuation um, of the seasons, droughts, um, floods um, will be less impacting your farm because of this, this resilience. I also want to highlight the third thing that people of and overlook really the importance of accessing capital, not just for financing for the farm, but also for the downstream actors, such as food uh, companies that all access pretty large amount of financing from institutional investors. Um, those institutional investors right now are uh, demanding the shift to uh, the climate related financial disclosures, which is what TCFD stands for, the task force for um, climate related financial disclosures, meaning that every company should demonstrate um, their emissions and the plan to mitigate them and the plan to work uh, in improving agriculture and the environment to be more resilient to sustainable long term, so that their businesses can be viable long term. This is to say, that the downstream players are very much incentivized to work with farmers to improve the situations upstream. Now, having reviewed this large scale trends, should we look at what does this really mean 
And will the sustainability agronomy be the new norm on the farm? Um, again, a few aspects to, to highlight. Um, first of which would, of course, be this productivity and the farm resilience piece. Um, um, the second one is that this trend is, of course, in line with the growing interest of the downstream players that we've highlighted to understand the emissions on the farm. What this means for the producer is that the first point we've covered, that this is good for them financially. And if this is not immediately easy and obvious in the short term, this is where that funding, either call it from regenerative agriculture programs or from carbon credits, um, although that's a bit of a loaded <laughs> couple of words, um, but the ecosystem payments is what can bridge the gap, um, help bridge the gap here to improve uh, the resilience on the farm. Um, in terms of the growing interest, growers can position themselves as much more um, attractive suppliers because they have lower emission factors. Um, strictly speaking, this means that if a global food company is looking to source oats or wheat or canola in three or four places around the world, um, a company like Regro will provide them with information as to how, based on emission factors, the, some of the maps you've seen earlier um, stack up across these different sourcing regions. And the growers that have adopted the right practices, especially for the long time, will be, will be favored. In the same vein, now when you think about the food companies favoring growers with good sustainability profiles, what we're also picking up on from our food uh, customer food com company customers is that whilst now is the time to share incentives and to accelerate the adoption of these practices in the market, there will be a time in the future, and this may be already in three to five years for some um, supply chains, that these sustainability requirements will become imperative. Um, so they will be written into um, purchase contracts. And this is something to be to be aware of as to how you can be working on improving um, the organization or helping your farmer customers or your farmer helping uh, changing your operation to be more sustainable to gain, gain these benefits. Lastly, the most obvious benefit um, is that you can get financial reward for the right practices. And this is what I'm calling, or we're calling it regrow and the risk share. Um, because obviously if you're adopting a new practice, if you're um, purchasing a new product, new biological product, or you're changing the crop rotation, it's, it's new. It's adopting something that is risky. Um, what if it's not going to work? What if the weather is going to pan out in a certain way that is not going to yield great, great results? Having supply chain partners that you participate in these initiatives with that do understand and provide some of the some of the payment in chunks so that you get the incentive, part of the incentive upfront uh, to manage your risk is quite important. And this is what we see happening with quite a number of our customers around the world. Now that we've talked about the microcosm of precision ag on the farm and the macrocosm of what are the trends, what does it mean for the, for the agri-food uh, community and how it impacts the farmer, I wanted to look into a couple of uh, use cases or case studies to just highlight to you how people are, uh, are adapting this around the world. Um, we, had the, uh, we have the pleasure of working with the Foundation of Arable Research in New Zealand. So all of the farmers that grow commodity crops in New Zealand um, are part of this um, organization. And um, quite a, a long time ago, so a couple of years ago now, um, they have requested for us to work on improving uh, their farm management system that we operate for them, that we have developed and, and operate for them called Production Wise to enhance the way that the information is captured about the nutrient use and the equipment use. And what you're seeing on the screen is the um, connections, uh, is the two, two screens separately. One on the left is looking at the carbon footprint calculator that looks at the use of energy, the fertilizer um, embedded emissions at manufacturing, <clears throat> nitrous oxide emissions uh, at application of fertilizer on the farm. There is a calculation of uh, direct emissions on the farm, indirect emissions connected to electricity, and, and finally scope three emissions. So something that um, farmer buys a product and has an embedded uh, set of emissions in it. This gives a farmer perspective 
as to how the sustainability metrics um, looking for a particular crop in particular season. And this, of course, can be extrapolated across a number of seasons for them. Uh, we also have included information in human language. <laughs> Tons of uh, carbon equivalents are often difficult things to wrap your head around. Uh, but here, for example, we equate the impact um, of the emissions from this season to 67 flights between Oakland in New Zealand and, and London in the United Kingdom, something you can relate to, um, or the way to kind of mitigate this impact would be to plant <laughs> the entire 11 hectares of trees, which is not uh, a small amount. So this is just given a farmer perspective uh, using the data directly um, coming into the farm management system uh, through um, all of the records that they keep on fertilizer use, on passes of machinery, um, it all feeds into it. And the calculator, uh, in this case, we use different models uh, for, for different occasions and use cases. In this case, this was a, a model that was specifically uh, supported by, by FAR and developed in New Zealand. We're also using other models for, for other geographies, depending on the jurisdiction and what it needs to comply with. On the right hand side, you can see a very interesting, I think, uh, specifically for, for Canada, for Canadian market, very relevant example um, of um, integration with the model that effectively seeks to compute how much nitrogen really is required by the crop and what can be um, leaching or what can be volatilizing so that it's not effectively used by the crop. Um, again, this is the case of feeding the information from a farm management system directly into the model so that the farmer can get an idea um, of um, the levels of usage of nutrients and, and whether they're above recommended level or under recommended level. In um, New Zealand, um, as far as I'm aware, uh, there are financial implications uh, in the same way that um, Canadian farmers pay taxes on, on fertilizer emissions that are embedded. In this case, uh, New Zealand growers uh, do have to pay um, a uh, some, some sort of fees for, for being um, in the area of overuse in fertilizers. So this is quite important. The country, of course, is protective of its beautiful natural resources. If you've ever been there, you're not surprised by it. Um, now, in terms of another use case, I wanted to share you, with you that is a bit closer to the North American example. And we're um, working with um, Cargill, our customer and partner, to uh, make this program in um, plus a different variation and form available in new geographies, including um, Canada. We're looking here at the screen from a regrow MRV software measurement reporting and verification tool. Um, you can access by the link here, cargill.regrow.ag. Regrow .ag. You can uh, see the video of um, what the, the, is the uh, flow for the grower as to how we go through this tool. Uh, they provide the information about their um, farm uh, management. It's first very light. Um, and then once they implemented certain practices in season, we're requesting the import of some of the data from for management system or equipment or entry of the records. But effectively, we estimate what will be the carbon impact, what will be the ecosystem outcome uh, that if you adopted certain practices, you would you would qualify for. And in this case, uh, we have our, our partner um, sharing the risk with the farmers um, and making some payments up front. So uh, if you wish to learn more about this program, head to cargill.regrow.ag and you will see a wonderful walkthrough video. Um, in this case, again, this is a standalone program where you can connect based on any farm management system compared to the previous use case we talked about. And in this case, you can see no-till cover crop, reduced tillage, but if we're looking at um, uh, countries such as Canada and Australia um, and the uh, majority of the European um, countries, we would be also looking at the nitrogen management and, and other um, practices that uh, are not yet considered status quo in those markets and will be considered uh, an improvement from the ecosystem perspective. Um, okay, we're uh, nearing um, 
the interesting part of uh, how it all ties together um, and think about the questions for the end of my talk. I very much would like to have a Q&A with you all and I'm looking forward to that. Um, and for now, I'll take a few more minutes talking you through how it all fits together in the big picture. So first of all, um, if you're looking at food and agriculture impact, if you're working with food and egg companies, whether it's the farm level, a cooperative level, whether it's a big food company level or a trader, international corporation, you need to start by understanding where things are at to measure them so you can manage them. And this in the context of sustainable agriculture um, or region ag is called baselining. So you want to be doing baselining of like where things are at, where have they been, where can we go from here? This is a critical critical piece. And in this case, I'm showing the screenshot of a particular uh, county um, where in different colors, you see the no-till adoption in light blue, the reduced tillage adoption in dark blue, and the conventional tillage in white. So imagine if we took um, such a map uh, and look at it in Saskatchewan, it probably will look like uh, no-till altogether. And that is a very important um, aspects of uh, regenerative agriculture programs because additionality here is what's at play. You need to demonstrate that the adoption of the practice has not reached the mainstream uh, point yet. And um, this also works in the other way for the farmer. If you can see the history of uh, what's happened on the acre, you can uh, help the farmer demonstrate they're more sustainable and resilient and therefore should qualify for cheaper finance um, or have uh, some preferential treatment on, on insurance products, etc. Now, the second piece is what we've talked pretty extensively about is the tie in between the agronomy and the measurement reporting verification tool. So it's the mix between now that you know what happened in the past, what do you decide to do to change it? How do you decide to impact the ecosystem outcomes of your farm management decisions? And of course, this is the interplay between agronomic decisions and ecosystem outcomes, so environmental outcomes. And by looking at both of those together, what makes sense agronomically from the perspective of weather, season, finances, soil moisture, all of those things. And what makes sense from the perspective of ecosystem outcomes? What emissions are we looking at? Embedded, also happening on the farm. What are we trying to optimize for? Soil health, compaction, and those two things now can, can work together. And the final piece is that they can make farmers some more some more money and they can decarbonize um, not fully, this is a bit of, again, loaded word, they can reduce the emissions in the agri-food supply chain because it's not tomorrow that we're going to go to net zero and net positive. This is definitely the North Star, but this is not yet the case. So estimating the outcomes so that farmers can be incentivized for them is, um, is a really important aspect because without this output where we can say on the little graph here at the bottom, for example, uh, you can see the dark green line being a particular field, imagine the field from this map being picked up and modeled in terms of we saw that three years ago it had wheat, two years ago it had canola, last year it had corn, and we saw what tillage practices were implemented based on the residue, we saw there was no cover crop, for example, we feed that all into the model uh, that is calibrated for the area and safe for us to use. We know the accuracy and uncertainty of it. And we make an estimate of soil carbon stocks, the changes on that piece of land uh, looking backwards. Um, so this is for a field uh, particularly that has adopted um, no-till and uh, has later on adopted cover crops in 2015. So the graph looks very positive. You can ask, uh, well, what's the red graph? Well, this is the counterfactual. So we are modeling that. What if that farmer has not made the decision to adopt these good practices? What if the weather was the same? What if the cropping pattern was the same? What have, would have happened? Because then they can say, well, here is how much carbon I have built up in the soil thanks to my good practices. And this is where um, maybe if you're a, a very early adopter, you're not eligible to be incentivized with the new carbon market schemes, but maybe this makes you a preferred supplier to a food company who wants to associate itself with the adopters of good practices and have low emission factors on its produce, which is very much not 
uh, not something to, to forget about. Um, some of the practical steps before we part, if you want to learn more about what I'm talking about and how all of the different actors fit together in this world, you can head to our website and um, put slash ebook. It should redirect you to the Carbon Markets ebook. You can also find it under resources. It is a very accessible um, PDF that talks about how everything fits together, what practices can be incentivized, et cetera. And it's a great resource that is, is very, very popular. So hopefully um, all of the hours of my experts in-house that have been used to write that ebook um, are going to be used for uh, used by you for, for, for good purpose. The uh, second thing is, of course, if you're involved in agriculture supply chain, uh, connect with some of your supply chain partners to talk about what incentives, what opportunities are available if you want to make a change. Um, and my advice is to really find a partner before you make the change so you can get the financial incentive for it. Because once you've made the change, it's almost considered part of the baseline. Um, in all of these projects, um, you can only take up to a certain amount of uh, historical change to really recognize it as, as recent. Um, and finally, you should consider what's, what's right for your operation. Um, if you're a food company sourcing, what do you want to promote? What are quality biodiversity or emission reduction? What are your goals? If you're a farmer and someone is sourcing from you, you should be thinking about what their goals are to uh, be able to claim, claim premium or pre be a preferred supplier. So hopefully I give you some food for thought today and I'm really hoping to get some, some questions from you now. Thanks a lot, Anastasia. It was, a, it was a great presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, it was, it's uh, pretty interesting to see how this is all uh, progressing. I guess before I get to some of these questions, you got a bunch. Um, I, but, you know, we, we, one of the, the constants that we have when we have these presentations is uh, how do we get uh, the growers to commit to this kind of stuff, you know, especially the ones that are not... Um, um, really tech savvy. How do we get them to say, hey, listen, this makes sense for me. Um, your, your model is much different than anyone else who's out, out there um, doing presentations. So what, how are you doing that? Yeah, I, I guess uh, we're in an interesting place where we're not directly approaching growers ourselves usually. We do a lot of education and a lot of support of the market because we really wanted to move to a more positive practices. Um, and in ecosystem outcomes uh, to be improved in agriculture. And um, we often leverage the channel partners, our customers who have relationships with the farmers. So we would often work um, with um, the advisors that the farmer has or the, the buyer that the, the farmer has already, and they would help enroll the farmers into the program. I would definitely say that the onus is um, on the farmer to make their um, earnest decision about like what do they feel is good for their farm because there will be many people coming and talking to them about well if you haven't adopted this we'll pay you to adopt xyz and the real implications of that maybe buying machinery or maybe implementing new practices you haven't implemented before and you should be asking for technical support in doing so so uh, we are seeing not so much uh, a hurdle to clear in terms of the farmer adoption from farmer interest, it, it makes good business sense. This, this brings enough money to cover some of the risks is this is not uh, you know, going to be bigger money pod than harvest, uh, <laughs> of course. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, you also see that this is finally the opportunity for the farmers to invest in the long-term objectives, which before were pretty much overlooked. Um, and it's just a question of how and getting into that safe space with the advisor that you have or with the, with the partners that you work with, because uh, you don't, don't have to do it alone. That's great. Um, so we do have a, a question from Cassidy. Um, hi, Anastasia. In this increasingly data-rich uh, precision ag world emerging, where do you find there are still significant data gaps for supporting sustainable ag and climate-friendly ag operations and business intelligence in the markets. 
Yeah, this is a great, um, great question. Um, as a very data hungry company, um, we certainly think about the availability of the data a lot. Uh, and this is what precludes sometimes our uh, rapid growth into new markets because um, such as the, the data market, such as the US one, is very uh, rich uh, in insights. You have a lot of defaults. You have National Agricultural Statistics Survey uh, that acts as a source of uh, data nationally when you want to find out what is a good practice in Iowa compared to North Dakota, compared to Oregon, compared to anywhere else. Um, this um, horizontal data sets are very important because um, Andrew, back to your first question, how do you um, make sure that it's easier for the farmer to adopt really? What we do in our software, we pre-fill a lot of the information so they can start with localized defaults rather than with zero. So we're not giving them a massive spreadsheet with very many en entries they need to make. We are pre-filling it based on where they are because this is an educated guess. And all they wanna know is if I change a particular aspect that matters to me, will it make a big enough difference? And they need to get to that with credible numbers that are true for where they are in terms of rainfall, soil management uh, inputs uh, as much as possible. So the availability of that type of data will really unlock uh, for us the adoption. Like we still can uh, 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 roll out our tools um, anywhere, but it will require a little bit more entry from the farmer, which is not the way that we think it, it, it should be. It shouldn't be burdensome on them. Um, so the opportunities to collect agricultural statistical horizontal data are, are really important, including things like uh, relatively high resolution soil maps. If the farm has it, then, then fantastic. Um, but this is not yet the case. And probably most of all, the biggest gap that some of you might not be aware is the fact that there are a very few uh, data sets that connect the interventions with ecosystem outcomes, such as soil carbon buildup, because you can really see that buildup over a long period of time. And this is where it's imperative that the governments invest in such programs where there can be tests and trials done either on farm or on research sites where the soil carbon can be managed uh, measured, sorry, uh, over long periods of time, um, because fluctuations year to year can be high, but fluctuations across five to 10 year scale are very visible. Um, so this is where I see the, the data gaps in our uh, data ocean. <laughs> um, yeah, and that makes a lot of sense, you know, as, as we gather more data and get more people involved and committed to getting, gathering this information, it should improve things. Um, we have a question from Sierra. She's a student from Lakeland College and Bachelor of Agriculture uh, Technology Program. Her question is, I noticed you look at nutrients by using soil mapping. What technology do you use, oops, I just moved myself, uh, in order to get this data um, in various areas? Do you use swamp maps or field, uh, file, uh, field uh, climate field view or other programs? Yeah, good, good question. So um, I can say that our modeling pretty much can take all the data that can be generated on the farm. And so if you can enrich the decision uh, context uh, for, the, for the decision, uh, it's very much something that the farmer and advisor are encouraged to do. Um, but in terms of the scalability of our approach, we have actually found a way um, to do crop modeling uh, in such a way that if you look at the satellite imagery and treat it as a proxy for the result, uh, then if you run the model and you understand that the crop model says, well, there was this much rainfall and the areas that would have been sandier would have gone uh, performed a lot better in this heavy rainfall. Um, and the areas that were very heavy clay, for example, would have performed not as well, and maybe they're compacted. You can then see what the performance was based on, for example, the soil map, uh, sorry, the satellite map is a proxy, and then the model gives you the soil map. So we do a lot of inference, a lot of what should we expect versus what did we get? Uh, and that infers our, um, in like it infers our um, the the missing pieces of information that are really hard to get because you wouldn't have every farmer have their their soil maps uh, and uh, details of every acre um, in their field view account or even from from machinery because it, what we found in the programs that we have been running is that about fifty percent of farmers are not coming from a farm management system and out of those that are coming from one 
Uh, not everyone has their equipment connected, so that's a lot smaller percentage yet again. And this is where we have always operated under the assumption that pretend the data just doesn't exist. Um, because if you will design your solutions for the 10% that have the data, you will not have the adoption that it takes. So you got to build some algorithms and use some modeling to just get to a good enough um, because everyone wants to be an editor and not the writer. If you give the user something, especially a farmer, something they can add it and point out the holes in or say like, okay, if I tweak this and that, this will be more like mine. That's a much better way of getting them to adopt the tool versus here's an open slate, paint. Uh, well, uh, I have a, a white canvas right there. It's still not painted for a year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that makes a that makes a lot of sense. So we got a question. Uh, another student from Lakeland College, Abby, um, and she was wondering how producers go about implementing uh, the the far into their farm. So obviously she's from a farm. She wants to get involved. What's what's the next step for a student? Well, no, she's on a farm. I'm assuming she's on a farm. So if she wanted to get on get into her family farm. What, what does she need to do? Um, in terms of implementing some of these practices, yeah. right? Yeah, um, I think it's a, it's a complex decision in the sense that um, usually what you would do is um, talk with your agronomic advisor to see if they have the capacity for any conservation support, if they are aware of, of the conservation uh, needs uh, for the farm. And this doesn't necessarily very narrowly look at, okay, I will plant a buffer around the creek if we farm next to the creek, or we will, I don't know, plant a, a pollinator habitat. This is really about more sustainable agronomy direction. So how do you make some of the changes? Um, and a lot of the farms in Canada have a relatively good baseline for sustainability because it's no-till and really cover crop is not an option. So you're looking at the nutrient management changes and nutrient management um, advice usually sits with, uh, with the agronomist. So between the farm manager and, and the agronomist, and this, this is where it's important to first look at what has been done to effectively the base, baseline. Um, also learn about the different practices that can be implemented from an ebook that I pointed out, for example. Um, and from there, you can already see with the advisor what is the right thing for this particular farm. Um, I would say usually for Canada, one of the most applicable uh, interventions will be the change in nutrient management. And there are different things you can do. It can be NERP or like four R's program, the right rate, the right place, the right product, the right amount. Um, if you haven't learned about it yet, it's a good time to learn about it. Perfect. Well, I think um, that pretty much uh, does it for us, uh, Anastasia. If there's anything else you want, uh, we're down to about uh, a minute and a bit uh, left on our time. Uh, if there's anything else you want to say to anybody, I want to thank you for your time. It was uh, really uh, great to have your presentation and um, really exciting on, on what you're doing at Regrow. And uh, if you want to get more information, you can always go to regrow.ag. And uh, oh, there it is. <laughs> she just pointed. Yeah, just go to the link and have a look at the ebook, and, um, and hopefully you will learn more. There's also some amazing videos that our experts have put, have put together that are uh, that go alongside the ebook. Uh, so more, more content and learning is available on the Regrow website. Um, thank you so much for having me and hope this was uh, uh, inspiring, insightful, informative, uh, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you Excellent. for having Thanks me. Thanks a lot. Uh, looking forward to following you as, uh, as things progress. Thanks. Bye-bye, Amy.